This meeting is being recorded. Good evening. This is the council's first work session in which we'll review the county executive's proposed general plan, HOCO by design. The proceeding this evening is a hybrid meeting, which will be held in person and via WebEx teleconference. It's also available to the public via video stream online at the county council website. The Council will conduct a series of work sessions and public hearings to review and obtain public comment on the proposed HOCO by design. Today's session covers Chapter 1, which is an introduction of the new general plan. Next Wednesday, March 29th at 9.30 a.m., the Council will hold our second work session to discuss the Growth, Con growth Conservation Chapter, the Future Land Use Map, also known as FLUME, Technical Appendix B Character Areas, and Fiscal Impact Analysis. The Council will host public hearings in July, August, and September. A complete calendar of Council meetings regarding the General Plan can be found on the Council's website at howardcountymd.gov slash home slash general plan. At this time, I'm going to do a roll call of the Council members. Mr. Youngman? Here. Ms. Young? Here. Ms. Walsh? Here. Dr. Jones should be joining us shortly. We'll now proceed with our agenda, which will begin with a presentation from the HOCO by Design core team. And you can tell us exactly how long you've been working to bring this to this moment. <laughs> oh, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Please begin, Director Thank Gowan. you so much for having us, members of the County Council. I'm Amy Gowan, the Director of Planning and Zoning, at least for the next week. Um, <laughs> thank you for, again, for this opportunity um, to start the conversation about HOCO by Design, our uh, general plan update, which also includes a plan for the Route, route 1 corridor. Um, tonight, as Chair Rigby mentioned, we're here to talk about the introduction, but a little more than that, we want to really walk through the key milestones throughout this process, uh, some of the underpinnings of the plan, and then talk about all the community engagement that was done throughout the last three years. So our presentation is about 45 minutes. Um, we'll each take turns so you don't have to listen to one person the whole time, and then we'll shift to uh, Q&A. But before we get started, if you don't mind indulging me for just a moment, this has been a three-year effort, and I just want to take a moment to recognize the tremendous job that has, that has been done by this team of extremely talented planning staff in our Department of Planning and Zoning. First and foremost, Mary Kendall directly oversaw this effort. She has been eating, sleeping, and breathing HOCO by design for the last three years. Um, she directly oversaw every aspect of the plan development. She authored several pieces of the plan. She's been a huge advocate for equity and affordable housing the whole entire time. Kate Bollinger is our project manager extraordinaire. She has done just about everything to keep the plan on track, to keep us all on track, drafting, editing, everything under the sun, and she's absolutely amazing. Sarah Latimer, who you'll meet to, at the next work session, Sarah has spent several months deep, deep in the weeds of land use modeling, a place nobody ever wants to be. And <laughs> that girl knows <laughs> what's on every parcel of land in the county at, at this point. And it really is important because the modeling that she's done allows us to know what our land supply is so we can ensure that we have accurate projections. Um, and then also deep in his own weeds was Jeff Brownell, but his were some fiscal weeds, and Jeff did multiple fiscal impact analysis on the plan, and he was a huge support in everything, APFO, schools, economic development, um, and d did all the projections for the plan as well. Um, again, Mary, with the support of Victoria Olivier, uh, really embraced the notion of equity in this plan, um, and they developed a whole DEI strategy reached out to underrepresented populations for the first time and really engaged them in this conversation. They did an exceptional job. Um, and then they went so far as to identify planning best practices for equity in general plans and identify all the policies in the general plan that impact these underrepresented populations. Susan Overstreet was the main author on ecological health as well as our environmental appendix and David Cookson on the county emotion chapter. So want to give them kudos for their efforts. Kristen O'Connor, guru on Route 1 from the time we went through the whole master planning process all the way through HOCO by design. Um, Kristen is also the chief of community planning, so she was overseeing the, the team as well. And then Hani Werner, she did all of our communications, 
all the engagement materials, all the pretty stuff that you see, our website. And um, thank you for approving her position in our budget because it was, it was a huge help to have all of that support through this process. And last but not least, our consultant, Matt Newcaster, who is with us virtually this evening. Um, Matt has really been one of us for the last three years. Um, he has brought a national perspective to this project. Uh, he has helped us tackle some of the complex issues with, with that perspective um, and helped develop the product that you see before you. So I just really wanted to stress the team effort that goes into an undertaking this large. And when, when people spend three years of their lives um, on one project, it really shows their dedication, perseverance, and all the talent that we have um, on hand to develop such a high quality work product. So thank you. Um, thank you so much to all the staff. So with that, and I, uh, with that, I will get off my soapbox, and Kate is probably like sweating over here thinking all the time that I'm taking up that she's going to have to try to make up. So if we go over the 45 minutes, it's my fault. <laughs> so I'll get started on the presentation. Um, the, we'll start by just reorienting everyone to what a general plan is, long-term vision for how the county develops and grows over the next 20 years. The goals are protecting the natural environment, strengthening economic opportunities, expanding transportation options, promoting diverse housing choices, prioritizing community character, and balancing growth and conservation. And HOCO by Design um, reinforces successful elements of the last general plan, Plan Howard 2030. While it may look very different, and it is certainly much more detailed, the plan is not a massive departure from the last decade. Plan Howard 2030 focused on the three pil pillars of sustainability, environment, economy, and community. HOCO by Design has a four-pronged aspirational approach um, built on equity, predictability, achievability, and sustainability. So when we talk about a more equitable plan, um, we're talking about advancing policies that enable all community members to participate in the process and providing them opportunities to prosper. It's more predictable in that it targets discrete areas of the county for growth and transforma transformation and then provides direction for our capital investment towards those areas. Um, and when we talk about sustainability, it, we highlight the concept of compact mixed-use activity centers. We also advance a number of environmental policies, but we also recognize the budgetary impacts of growth. So we look at, when we talk about sustainability, we're looking at it not from an environmental and a budgetary perspective. And then finally, uh, more achievable, basically providing clear direction and actions which are more specific, measurable, and realistic uh, that are grounded in fiscal and land use modeling. So this next slide is an infographic that we use to educate the public about the influences of the general plan in relation to other planning documents. And it's worth reinforcing that the general plan is used as a bit of a playbook or a roadmap, giving direction to multiple county agencies about various topics. So we try to keep the general plan at a high level, but provide clear direction for functional plans like the climate action plan, the bike plan, the ped plan to further advance their policy, dire pol the policy direction from the general plan in those functional plans. Also to note, there are two plans um, that were part of Plan Howard 2030, the Downtown Columbia Plan, the Ellicott City Watershed Master Plan. They were both incorporated by reference in Plan Howard 2030 and will be um, carried over into HOCO by design. There are, nothing is changing. They are just um, merely transitioning over into this, this new plan to be a part of it. In addition, we have the, the Route 1 corridor plan, which has been woven into the HOCO by design planning effort. Um, and then we'll have a future work session on that plan. So this is another slide that we developed to educate the public um, about what drives growth. And it's important to note that when a general plan is adopted, things don't necessarily change immediately or quickly, and some things may not change at all because the general plan is really one piece of a larger economic picture when it comes to growth drivers. You have to have willing property owners um, that want to sell, redevelop, or preserve their land. There has to be market demand uh, for the types of development that is proposed in the general plan. One of the things that we've heard along the way from the development community is that there's not when we talk about missing middle housing, there isn't really a, 
a tested market out there yet, right? And there isn't, in, in, at least in Howard County, and there isn't a model home that's available. And so it's going to take some time for that to materialize and develop that, um, that market demand that would then uh, result in lending institutions feeling confident in lending, in, uh, lending to these types of projects as they move forward. Um, and of course, you have government in the middle of it all that is an active participant in ways, um, in some instances, we, you know, we regulate growth through our laws and our policies. In other ways, we may support certain types of growth, like affordable housing. And, though, and for just some additional background, I wanted to touch on the key project milestones, which we're going to walk through in more detail this evening. So we kicked this off three years ago in the winter of 2020. Um, when we engaged our multidisciplinary team that was led by our consultant, Matt Nuncaster from City Explained. However, we didn't start in earnest really until the summer of 2020 and the fall when the guidelines were approved and the planning advisory committee was appointed by the council and the executive. And we'll get into more details about all of these community engagement milestones later in the presentation. Um, other notable milestones to point out are the physical assessments the drafting of our planning themes, all of the scenario modeling and testing, and our strategic advisory groups. And these all transpired over that, um, that year. Um, and all of these elements, uh, if you could go back, all of these elements here uh, gave us the data and the best practices that we were able to pair with community feedback uh, to develop the plan. And again, we're going to talk about these tonight and in subsequent work sessions. And finally, this is a continuation of, um, that brings us up to date now. Uh, you'll see the new town work sessions that we held in 2021, the release of the planning theme chapters throughout 2022, where we rolled out each uh, planning theme chapter um, one by one and received detailed and meaningful, real, really meaningful feedback on each chapter individually. Um, and then here we are tonight at our first work session. Um, we did receive a unanimous endorsement from the planning board. Uh, recommending approval for the plan uh, with a little bit of guidance on the housing allocation chart. Um, and at this point, I will, I'm happy to turn it over to Matt Nuncaster, who is uh, virtual, and he's going to talk about an overview and analysis of the best, best practices that inform the plan. Matt? Great. Thank you, Amy. And just to check, you all can hear me okay? Sorry, we're, none of us are mic'd, but yes, we can hear you. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Thank you so much. Just wanted to make sure before I really get into a ramble here. Um, well, again, this, this section of the presentation, I wanted to highlight a lot of the data and information that we had collected um, and built a strong foundation on. And to start out, you may remember seeing this graphic and this slide. We used it early and often throughout the planning process, but it kind of captures our approach in one slide. And it, we started with community input. And I've been told that this is probably the largest effort or, or most comprehensive effort the county has done for a project to date. It's truly impressive nationally when I compare it to the other work that we do, as well as the work of my peers. There was a lot of work that came into engaging the community and really partnering uh, to come up with recommendations, listening to recommendations and the like. And I'll let Mary tell you more about that later in the presentation. But that was a really solid part of our, our effort. For me, I'm going to focus more on the data and analysis that we had done. And as part of that, we had 12 different members on our team and the consultant team that brought different subject matter, acts, subject matter experts into the fray. But we also were able to team through the technical advisory group and some other things we'll explain later, uh, a lot of county resources and expertise, which was fantastic. And then we also were able to find experts in the community who served on things like the strategic advisory groups and things of that that we'll explain later as well. Also, one of the, the roles we were given is under the best practices, where when we tried to think of ideas or some, some new issues that were facing the county, and we'll go through some of those here shortly, um, we were able to bring in some experiences from other places where things had worked, where they haven't worked, in order to uh, broaden the perspective and, and some of the do's and don'ts of what's been done before you. And as you can imagine, um, nothing went on pause uh, when we started this process. So we kind of inserted ourselves into a lot of things that were ongoing. Um, and here's a list that you see on the left that just kind of captures some of the things that we were looking at at the time. 
uh, obviously continued uh, interest and desire to live within the county, to work within the county, and so growing population and employment. Uh, as everything is going on, though, you're starting to have a limited supply of undeveloped land, which creates uh, great competition for space. And we were finding things. One of the earliest conversations I had is, do we put a park or a fire station on the same piece of property? That's how limited your land supply was, which was really interesting. We've talked a lot about affordable housing, um, and that discussion started from day one of the process as well. Some of the discussions about the weather patterns and flooding and climate change we're able to, to pick up on right away. Um, and also other processes that were going on in studies like the Housing Opportunities Master Plan, the work of the Spending Affordability Advisory Committee and others were going on. So we really wanted to just immerse ourselves in what was happening. And then as you can imagine, uh, in March 2020, three years ago now, uh, we had a, an interesting phenomenon occur, right, with COVID-19. And uh, that threw us a little bit of a curveball. But I, this team, as Amy had mentioned, I'm proud of it as much as she is. And they did a wonderful job adapting and pivoting. And I still think we had incredible participation and engagement throughout the process. And so the other thing that we did under the data and analysis um, initiative was what we called our book report series, our physical assessments. And there were seven topics that we focused on. You see them listed here. In total, it was about 419 pages that were written uh, and, and made available to the public. We um, sent those through our planning advisory committee, as well as had public meetings to uh, explain them, get input on them, uh, make sure we were getting it right and getting a good foundation. And we refer to these uh, often throughout the planning process. And then we also looked a lot at just sort of what else is happening, uh, short term and long term, uh, both uh, locally, regionally and nationally. And so we looked at a lot of other topics as well and things like emerging technologies, the whole concept of climate change, uh, workplace, whether it's in person, in office, different economic preferences that are coming online, demographic trends that are changing, uh, were all things that we looked at. And then we also continued on looking at things like what does transit mean uh, in a decade or two decades from now? Is it still the 53 person bus or is it micro transit led by Uber or Lyft or something of that nature? The whole idea of autonomous vehicles and what does that mean for unlocking additional capacity in our roads as they're used more efficiently by cars who talk to each other. Uh, again, the whole idea about creating great places so that if you, whether you telework or work in place, um, how do you create something really nice to look at and experience? E-commerce was something else we looked at in terms of how is, how is the way we shop changing? Uh, so we have that versus brick and mortar stores. And if we're doing e-commerce, this desire to have these holding warehouses so that we can get things delivered quickly. And then the idea about slowing birth rates, uh, immigration, uh, growing senior populations and the like were all things on our mind as we went forward. And this was one of the more interesting um, topics that we had looked at was when we, and as mentioned, Sarah Latimer's done a tremendous amount of modeling on this. So we've got a lot of precision that goes with these findings. Um, but this whole idea about the amount of land that was available to do something and whatever something was and how much demand there was to do that something. And so first we started out looking at kind of what is the market uh, calling for? If you wanted to accept it, how much demand would be there? Uh, and you could see that being between Baltimore and Washington and in a great corridor, there's a lot of employment that's being projected in the, in the decades to come. Um, and so it's really driving the growth that we have. Uh, and then the idea of retail to help support some of that, as well as new rooftops to support employees who want to be close to their jobs. All this stuff comes in and it's kind of like a, it's the hardest plan probably you've had to write so far as a community because you've run out of land in some way. So you've gotten to your inflection point or a point of key decision about what do you do when you have demand and limited supply? Do you change? Do you just say no? All that kind of stuff is very important. And so there are very key questions that we had to answer this go around. And it's, it's the whole uh, trade-offs of protecting natural resources versus planning for infrastructure versus economic opportunities. And what do you do um, in an unlimited amount of land?
And then we also were able to infuse some information both uh, within Maryland and beyond and in the re national perspective about just some things that are going on right now. So the first one was with mixed use activity centers. Uh, they're obviously uh, being touted around the country because of, it's a place where you can be a resident, an employee, and a visitor and have different experiences, but all really enjoy where you're at. They generally have higher activity going on. There's more energy going on in these places, and there are a lot of options that happen. Actually, these places are interesting because they work well because employers and employees are looking to be in places of action. But also, if you're a telework uh, type uh, situation, you also want to be able to walk out of your door and have something to do immediately uh, when you're finished with work or on lunch uh, break, you go for a walk or those kind of things. So we're finding that actually it's solving two demands as we go through. This is one of the reasons why we're continuing to look at activity centers as part of HOCO by design. Again, as Amy had mentioned, some of these ideas are from Plan Howard 2030, both a little more precision this time around. But again, we got to look at the mixed use centers. A lot of these centers right now uh, might be single use retail centers right now with large parking lots. Uh, so some interesting things to look at there. And as you go to the next slide, you see many of these centers, if they are realized, will be redevelopment projects or infill projects. And I think there's a great opportunity here for Howard County because of how forward thinking you are, that just because you redevelop a site doesn't mean you pack it in. Um, we heard a lot through the community and the advisory groups about maybe how you return parking lots to green space. Uh, how do you integrate open space with development, do better stormwater management, introduce, introduce or reintroduce landscaping uh, to create character. Also, maybe how these places serve multiple travel modes. Uh, can you walk or bike to them? How is transit handled in the future? Uh, so it's not just about large parking lots and how you drive most conveniently to them. And then also there's this opportunity as we get into, and we'll do it in, in future meetings with other chapters, but this whole idea about missing middle housing and different housing types. So how do you put housing in these activity centers that are not all stacked multifamily units is a real opportunity as we go forward. And then speaking more about missing middle, just to make sure we all have a, a good definition underneath us and a picture to go with it. You see on the left-hand side, some of those white buildings are the traditional single family detached homes that you see in a lot of communities throughout America. And on the right-hand side, you start to see a lot of the apartments or condominiums that are stacked on top of each other, usually in larger uh, buildings. Those are two uh, uh, miles or uh, endpoints uh, within the spectrum that uh, everybody kind of can put their mind around. The missing middle concept is really harking back to housing types that were popular years ago uh, and decades ago. Things like having duplexes or triplexes. Uh, maybe having four to six units together and calling that multifamily uh, instead of having 300 units in a complex together. The idea about townhomes uh, and also live work units where you can live above a place uh, that either you have a direct relationship to or maybe you just live above the restaurant, for example. And then we also looked a lot at accessory dwelling units. Um, honestly, I do a lot of this work around the country and a lot of the leading ideas are coming out of your region, uh, whether it's the discussion going on here, what's happening in Montgomery County and some other places. Uh, so we talked a lot about accessory dwelling units. Generally speaking, it's a smaller independent unit uh, that is on the same lot as an individual home. Uh, and they can take a, a lot of different shapes. And so you see on the right-hand side, uh, some imagery that we had created for this project where the ADU could be a, a part of the home attached to the main living area. It could actually be above a garage, detached, like you see in the second line. It can be part of an attic. It could be part of a basement. Um, or it could be a standalone unit, not above a garage. So when we're talking about accessory dwelling units, there's still a lot of options out there and a lot of varieties and forms it can take. All right, so again, as we had mentioned, this is the first of many meetings, as you know, and so we just wanted to set up some of those big ideas that were coming. I now want to turn a little bit more to some of the, the partners that we had in this process to make sure we acknowledge um, everybody that uh, moved this ball forward to where we are today. So the first group to recognize here is our planning advisory committee. 
Uh, there were 33 members on this committee. Uh, we had 11 meetings with them in total. Several of those meetings went many, many hours. Uh, this group was very adaptable because we did some of them virtually. We did some of them in person. And then we did some where right, right at the kind of the COVID tipping point um, uh, with quarantines and, and things, we would do them in person and hybrid. And we would have people participate both ways, which is really awesome. As part of this process, they were really integral into things like the future land use map that you'll see, the flume, uh, it, was, it was, was mentioned in the opening. The whole idea about character areas, which are the colors on the flume, they had a lot of influence and input on that as well. And we had uh, complete meetings that just talked about the different major policy issues and recommendations. And so they were a great sounding board for us because they were with us through the entire process. We were able to really have some in-depth conversations with the planning advisory committee. We also made use of what was called a technical advisory group, our TAG, and that was made up primarily of county department staff or other partner organizations, for example, the school district. And they were there to uh, provide us technical advice, give us data, uh, provide us functional plans that had been done before, and again, be a sounding board for us. And they were able to verify and validate some of the key findings we were finding as a consultant team or others making sure everything made sense, uh, that the trends seemed to be what we were seeing, uh, and that the data was sound, that we could rest on sound data. And then later in the process, we created three strategic advisory groups, uh, which I was also very proud of uh, within this planning process. It showed that willingness to go into more detail on some of the hot topics and issues that were uh, rising to the top within the planning process. And we had three committees. We had one for planning school capacity and growth. We had one for examining climate uh, change and natural resources. And then we had one looking at diversifying housing stock and creating opportunities for the missing middle housing. And this was a group that was being more specific on this issue because the housing opportunity master plan was just wrapping up as this group was starting. And so we felt that this was one place we wanted to dive into more detail uh, before we, we started writing the plan. Uh, each of these groups created a set of recommendations uh, that we were able to rely on and lean on when we were drafting the chapters. All right. All right, I'll jump in now. Thank you, Matt. Uh, much appreciated. Mm -hmm. Uh, so good evening, everyone. My name is Mary Kendall, Deputy Director with the Department of Planning and Zoning. And I would be remiss if after Amy gave all of us these wonderful accolades, if I didn't recognize her for her leadership to get us through the last three years. Thank you. <laughs> Not to mention her amazing leadership the entire eight years that she has been um, with DPC. Okay. So now I'm going to attempt to summarize three years of engagement in 15 minutes or less. All right? So... <laughs> Maybe before you run out of your Diet Coke. <laughs> That's right, okay. Um, so every key milestone that we saw earlier involved community input. And the amount and diversity of engagement opportunities, as Matt already mentioned, is truly unprecedented in the county compared to other planning processes. So this slide shows you a snapshot of our engagement metrics. Overall, uh, so we hosted nearly 100 community meetings. Um, if you counted this, we probably would be at 100. <laughs> uh, we received more than 12,000 comments from the public. We distributed more than 80,000 flyers, and we have nearly 2,000 subscribers to our email list. Uh, and now I'm going to walk you through how we got to these totals. <clears throat> so back to the beginning when uh, COVID was shutting down the country. Uh, so that was also when we kicked off our planning process. And that was when we realized that our plans for online engagement, they expanded and they became so much more important. So our first step in the process was to raise broad awareness about the, about the planning process. Uh, so we started with a robust website and a social media presence. We developed printed materials, so those were about 80,000 flyers and postcards that we distributed in roving radish meal kits, in library book pickups, and in all of the water bills uh, that are sent out here in Howard County. Uh, also in yard signs, there were a lot of people who were just 
going to parks, trying to be outside, get out of the house. Uh, so we recognized that's where people were. So we uh, created some really lovely uh, yard signs that we put in the uh, parks that people could use. They could scan their phone with a, using a QR code to kind of be directed to the website. Uh, and of course, being that Howard County is such a diverse place where nearly 30% of all residents speak a language other than English at home, we did translate a lot of our materials into multiple languages. And even our Hoko by Design website has incorporated a Google translation feature. So any of that information can be um, translated. <clears throat> So this slide shows um, some of our initial engagement activities where we first started to seek input from the public, and that was back in the fall of 2020. Uh, this shows our overall participation numbers, and despite COVID, we had really significant participation. And actually, attendance at these all virtual events was higher uh, than what it was in in-person meetings pre-pandemic. And we think that because there was just, it was a bit, once we all learned how to use some of these virtual platforms, me included, um, we learned that it was just a little bit perhaps easier to participate at home. Uh, and we also offered a lot of creative ways with which people could engage um, with the process. Um, so we think that led to increased participation. And what were some of these creative activities? Uh, well, first we had an activity that was called On the Table. Uh, in this Community members were invited to hold small discussion groups with friends and family where they could just informally talk about the future of the county. Uh, so not only did community members host these events, but uh, DPZ did as well. And some people held them around fire pits in their backyard, and DPZ, we hosted a good number online. And there were 260 participants in this particular activity. And through these kinds of informal discussion groups, we found that that was a way that we could reach more diverse and underrepresented populations. It was just a more comfortable way in which to engage with people. Then we created this online mapping activity. I hope everyone remembers all of these. Uh, we called this the Better Communities Online Game. Uh, people could place dots on areas in the county that they wanted to see redeveloped or preserved, and also identify what types of amenities they wanted to see where. Uh, and we had really great participation in that, about 485 um, participants. Uh, at the same time that this was happening, we held what we called our Community Ideas Exchange Workshop. Uh, in person uh, or pre-COVID, this would have been an open house. Uh, so we tried to get creative um, and invested some funds in developing a virtual open house. Uh, and participants had the experience of walking around, uh, visiting different stations, learning about different topics, but then generally at most stations, they could give us input on the topic that was being asked. Uh, so then we realized well, we really need to um, give the public the opportunity to have a bit of a meet and greet with the project team. Uh, so that was when we started to have our series of virtual meetings and the first one we called BYOQ, um, kind of like BYOB, but it was BYOQ, bring your own questions. Um, and uh, basically the public had the opportunity to learn a little bit more about what to expect during the planning process and ask, some, ask us some initial questions and we gathered some initial feedback. Uh, then we had a good number of meetings, which, which Matt mentioned about our physical assessments. Those were our book reports in which we invited the community to learn more about some of our initial findings um, on topics like the environment, land use, and agriculture. <clears throat> So towards the end of this initial engagement, while we were certainly pleased with the participation numbers, we saw a real opportunity to bring um, a greater sense of diversity, equity, inclusion into the process. And this was absolutely underscored by many of our council members. For those of you who may remember, three years ago, uh, the general plan guidelines work sessions. Uh, there was a lot of um, interest expressed about how do we engage these diverse populations. But also, uh, we were urged by our planning advisory committee to do the same. So uh, recognizing that um, basically these focus groups and formal discussions seem to work best, we adopted that as a new engagement platform to engage these groups. And some of these underrepresented populations are groups like working parents, students, young adults, uh, communities and people of color and small business owners. Um, and we were able to engage through these focus groups uh, about 100 people. Uh, we found that these focus groups offered um, flexible scheduling, uh, an informal way to engage, um, and we were able to collect valuable input that really complemented a lot of the feedback we had received uh, thus far. 
So a summary of all of our findings from the focus groups can be found in a, in a report on our website. Uh, but not only did we integrate this diversity, equity, and inclusion lens into the process, but it is also integrated into the plan. In each chapter, you'll see that we summarized what we heard from the focus groups. And as Amy had already mentioned, we included best practices that are um, produced by the American Planning Association for advancing equity in general plans. And all of the policies and actions that are um, that follow these best practices, they've been identified with a flame within the plan. Uh, and those policies and actions are intended to contribute to a more equitable future. So with all of this input that we um, gathered from these initial engagement activities, we developed what we called our planning themes. Uh, those are basically our major chapters, or also we were referring to them as some of the more significant issue areas for the county and the general plan. So those are the chapters that are called Dynamic Neighborhoods, Quality by Design, Economic Prosperity, County in Motion, uh, and Ecological Health. And of course, when we first identified these themes and all of the topics that could be covered within them, uh, like good planning staff, we issued a survey, collected feedback, um, and got input, and then uh, were able to refine the uh, planning themes and the topics within them based on that input. Next in the process, uh, we hosted what we called the Growth Choices Workshop. Uh, at that workshop, we presented eight key decision points and four alternative growth scenarios for our county's future growth development and conservation. Uh, we had a series of meetings, I think um, about seven, <laughs> five to seven, um, with uh, significant opportunities to provide feedback via polling. Uh, and also opportunities for discussion. And then we also had an online component for those who couldn't attend the meetings uh, and a really nice creative story map um, that also included a survey. And a lot of this input helped to inform our future land use map, which we also have been referring to as the hybrid scenario, which we'll talk more about in the next work session. Um, and also it helped inform some of our policies in the plan. And now then we had a series of what we called uh, Newtown design sessions. Um, we really wanted to make sure this plan did have a focus on Newtown to ensure that the special, special nature of it being a planned community was recognized and captured in HOCO by design. We held a total of three meetings. Two of them were online. One was an in-person open house, which by the way was the first in-person public meeting or event that was uh, held by the county post the COVID shutdown. Um, and these design sessions, they were really about trying to understand what the community's design preferences were, and then they were applied to hypothetical redevelopment scenarios. And illustrations were prepared and refined for our village centers, parking lots, older apartment complexes, uh, existing employment areas along commercial corridors and gateway. Then in the next slide, fall of 2021, um, we held a series of seven workshops, which we called the Draft Plan Workshop Series. And at those workshops, we presented emerging ideas and general some broad recommendations for the plan. And at the workshops, we displayed a draft future land use map, and we discussed key topics that would appear in the draft. Uh, these sessions were fairly well attended. Um, they were generally, um, they were both virtual uh, and we had, I think, one in person. And generally speaking, all of our virtual meetings have had better attendance um, than some of our in-person meetings. And now we're in 2022 and we're almost in 2023. Um, so that was when we released our planning theme chapters. And I believe that was when we had our first hybrid meeting for HOCO by Design. And being that these chapters are lengthy, um, we decided to release one chapter at a time uh, to really give us the opportunity to engage the community in more in-depth dialogue about key topics, policies, and implementing actions that appeared in those draft chapters. Um, at the same time, we were also still going out in the community trying to raise general awareness about the planning effort and these planning theme chapter meetings and continue to solicit feedback. Now moving into the end of 2022, beginning of 2023, when we get into releasing um, the draft plan. So after all of that input that we received from the uh, release of the draft chapters, uh, we refined our full draft, our full public draft, and released it in all of its 700 pages in December of 2022. Um, and also we had a very, about a 60 day public comment window um, and during that period, we hosted what we called an equity open house. 
uh, and we invited the community to come and share their thoughts about some of the equity-focused policies in the plan. Um, and also, uh, during this process, we partnered with community-based organizations to host um, other meetings uh, in which we discussed how the plan incorporated an equity lens. All of these activities can be found in our engagement summary online. Um, and also all of the written comments that we receive through surveys can be found in our comment log also online. All right, so what did we hear through this process? Um, so all of what we have heard is summarized within each of those planning theme chapters, but this gives you an overall sense of what we heard. Um, these were some of the topics that we heard about most frequently. A lot of, I'm sure all of you hear this in the, in the community as well. Uh, a lot of concerns about housing, infrastructure, green spaces, affordability, schools, the environment. And of course, um, probably because we had a spotlight on Newtown, we heard about Newtown, Columbia, and our village centers. And all of this input was used to draft our vision statement, uh, and this slide includes some excerpts from it. Uh, so the general plan, HOCO by Design, recognizes that the county is a welcoming and inclusive place with thriving neighborhoods and abundance of open space, and has wanted to be a place where there are housing opportunities accessible to all. The overall vision is to accommodate growth while improving upon the county's unique and varied character. It's also about prioritizing the natural environment, historic resources, agriculture, diversity, and character while addressing infrastructure in a timely and fiscally responsible manner. So, what we can do here, so if you'd like a snapshot of what's to come, we do have a few slides of just a big picture snapshot of everything that's in the plan. Uh, but we're also happy to pause and jump into to q and if, if there are some burning questions about data, best practices, or community engagement. Yeah, okay, great. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Kate. All right, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Kate Bollinger. I'm a planning supervisor with DPZ. And I'm gonna give you a high level orientation to the HOCO by Design plan and the Route 1 plan. So uh, this is just a screenshot of our table of contents. And uh, as you can see, there are 11 chapters in HOCO by Design. There are three associated appendices. And then we also have our Route 1 plan. And all together, we're looking at uh, nearly 750 pages. So we did want to highlight the, um, some key points uh, out of all of this content for you. So you can group some of the chapters together, starting with the five planning themes. Um, this goes back to that themes board that Mary showed earlier with uh, ecological health, county in motion, economic prosperity, dynamic neighborhoods, and quality by design. And um, these are all about protecting uh, ecology, addressing climate change, creating a safer, more equitable transportation system, lifting up small and local businesses while retaining industrial land, supporting the agricultural community, promoting missing middle housing, accessory dwelling units, and a mix of age-friendly housing options. And then finally, it's about preserving the unique character of the many areas and neighborhoods around the county. And then um, in addition to the themes, there's also this set of four chapters that together speak to growth, conservation, and infrastructure in the county. So this is chapter two, eight, nine, and 10. And uh, these give uh, the framework for growth and conservation, recommendations for managing growth and how we should plan for future infrastructure needs, including public schools. So chapter two is where you can find the strategy for balancing growth and conservation, uh, and also the future land use map or the flume that you've already heard um, about throughout the presentation. Chapter eight is public schools. And um, you know, while the vast majority of planning for schools is going to uh, continue to be conducted by HCPSS, this chapter offers recommendations for improving collaboration and partnerships with respect to locating funding and building facilities to meet the needs of the student population. Then chapter nine gets into 
infrastructure, uh, parks and recreation, fire and rescue, water sewer, public safety. And this chapter also talks about recommendations for making the capital budgeting process sustainable and equitable. And then finally, chapter 10 is managing growth. So this is where you can find a direction on changes recommended to adequate public facilities uh, and also the housing allocation chart. So that covers um, those chapters. And then, of course, the future land use map is a major component of the general plan, again, found in chapter two and will be part of our next work session. And uh, this is where you'll see the 18 character areas. Uh, those are meant to be broad land use categories that give general guidance on preferred development types and patterns to uh, help define a sense of place or character. And so it's not a zoning map, but it's meant to inform future zoning changes. And um, the way that this map depicts HOKO by Design's growth and conservation strategy is by uh, maintaining open space on the map with a, a character area for open space, and then also identifying other types of characters. Uh, for instance, you see a lot of gray along the Route 1 corridor. That's industrial, where industrial land uh, will be retained. And then you see uh, this set of activity centers that Matt was speaking to. So those are the shades of red on the map. Sorry, Kate. The shades yeah. of red along the um, Anne Arundel border, those are the TODs, is that correct? Yeah, those are the TOD. We call them Transit Activity Center in HOCO by Design, same as Got TOD. It. Yep, yep. And then finally, uh, the implementation chapter is where everything comes together. So this is where you can find the matrix of all of the policies and implementing actions throughout the entire plan. Uh, along with lead agencies, partner agencies, time frame for implementation, and guidance for future reporting on the implementation of the plan. And then there's these three uh, technical appendices. So we have an environment appendix that's a supplement to the ecological health chapter uh, that gets into more detail on uh, some of the topics that are needed um, for the, the water um, resource element of the general plan. Thank you. Um, then we have the character areas appendix. We're going to talk about that next week when we talk about chapter two that gets into all of the nuts and bolts of those 18 character areas. And then we have the focus areas appendix. And this is a companion document to the quality by design theme. And this is where we've captured the output of those new town design sessions with illustrative concepts for new town and for gateway and also for the rural crossroads. And last but not least, uh, we have the route one plan. So uh, you may recall that back in 2018, DPZ uh, led a master planning initiative to develop recommendations on revitalizing Route 1. And there was a year of public engagement that involved uh, workshops and open houses and surveys. And uh, what we ended up doing is we wrapped all of the public feedback and the analysis that had gone into that effort in 2018 into HOKO by Design. And um, an advantage of doing that was that Route 1 was able to be looked at comprehensively with the rest of the county as part of the modeling and growth scenarios uh, that were done for the general plan. So um, the Route 1 corridor plan, the vision within it is emphasizing preserving Washington Boulevard as an industrial employment and transportation corridor while also targeting uh, very specific areas for mixed use redevelopment in activity centers. And then in Route 1, um, some of those areas are intended to allow light industrial uses within mixed use settings. Uh, so this is a new industrial mixed use activity center character area developed for Route 1 that was also extended to uh, part of East Columbia. And with that, 
uh, we've concluded the overview of all of those 750 pages to come in our future work sessions, and we can return back to the focus of tonight, uh, chapter one in the introduction, and you've heard all about the background, the data analysis, best practices, advisory committees, and community engagement. All right. Um, so I was thinking we could start and then just sort of go around each question, um, perhaps presuming, but would you like to start, Ms. Young? Oh, we're not going to keep going.